super excited to be back in Paris in this beautiful venue. And thank you to uh, Sylvain, uh, Ferdinand, and all the team for putting together this amazing first uh, SWIFT conference. So I'm just going to kick this off by asking you guys two quick questions. Who in the room has been building some SWIFT apps or planning to do so in the next few months? Wow, that's a lot of you. That's awesome. And who in the audience have um, already started building frameworks or SDK in SWIFT or like did something special to support them uh, in SWIFT? A um, little bit of you. Great. Cool. So today I'd like to tell you a few stories, um, especially how we built Fabric, our new mobile platform at Twitter to support Swift uh, from day one at launch. So my name is Romain. I'm a developer advocate uh, at Twitter, but I also work closely with the product and engineering teams uh, of Fabric. And just before we dive in, um, I'd like to give you an overview of what Fabric is and how it was born. So Twitter has always had uh, a mobile DNA. From its launch eight years ago as an SMS-based product, Twitter evolved along the way with the mobile ecosystem. But when we look back on 2009, uh, back then we only had 10 engineers roughly working on all the iOS and Android apps for us. And we were quite struggling at the time, like shipping new features and making sure that our apps were stable. So we considered building our own tools, and we tried quite a lot of them. But there is one product in particular which really helped us uh, to have some stable and reliable apps. And that product is Crashlytix. Crashlytix is a super lightweight crash reporting solution. It gives you a lot of insights on what's happening uh, in your app. And we love the team and the product so much that we actually acquired Crashlytix two years ago, and they're now part of the Twitter fa family. Uh, so they kept shipping a lot of uh, developer tools over the past uh, couple of years. And fast forward to today, we are in a much better shape when it comes to uh, supporting um, you know, new features inside our iOS app, for instance. We launched uh, uh, last week uh, group DMs, but also uh, native videos. So you can tell we are in a much better shape when it comes to building stable uh, apps on mobile. But stability is not the whole story. And when we talk to developers, sometimes they have other challenges. One of them is monetization. Let's say you're building a game in Swift, you're shipping it to the App Store. Maybe you still want to have some uh, revenue coming in. So that's why we acquired Mopub, which is uh, the leading ad exchange uh, for mobile. And for developers, it's a breeze. Basically, you have one SDK, and you can tap onto all the ad networks instead of putting many SDKs inside your app. So we had Crashlytix, we had Mopub, but we also wanted to uh, tackle and hopefully solve more challenges, not only for us at Twitter, but for the entire and broader developer community. So that's why we uh, started Fabric. Fabric, for us, um, is a way to make uh, mobile development easier. And um, we want to see it as an umbrella, like a platform where you can pick and choose the functionality that you need specifically for your app. So I'm not going to um, you know, give you all the details about the features and the functionality that we shipped. But long story short, we group them by what we call kits. So we have the Crashlytix kit, the Twitter kit, and the Mopub kit. But really, when we see those kits, for us, we see them as solutions for the challenges that developers have every single day. So with Crashlytics, you can make sure your app is more stable, more reliable, and higher quality. With the Twitter kit, we want uh, developers to be able to tap into the pulse of the planet, distribute the apps more easily, but also um, leverage something called Digits, which is our brand new way to sign up with a phone number uh, on mobile apps. And finally, we have Mopub for revenue. So Fabric was actually uh, being quite advanced when uh, Swift was announced by Apple. And what's interesting is like we were not sure at the beginning uh, the amount of work that would be required uh, to support Swift at launch with Fabric. But we knew we had some common goals. Because for us, the goal of Fabric is to make sure that developers can be super effective. Uh, they can focus on their exclusive and unique features like uh, their UI or their, you know, key functionality, rather than spending time uh, on like crash reporting solutions and, and things like that. And Swift, as an exciting new language, uh, allows developers to focus on their code, write it faster, read it better, and hopefully make uh, less mistakes. So we had those common goals. So I'm just going to pause right here and tell you a little bit of a story of an app called Cannonball. So when we were preparing for uh, Fabric, we wanted to have something that would highlight and showcase the functionality that we were about to ship. So to be frank and honest with you, my, I didn't have much experience with Objective-C myself. I actually discovered um, uh, iOS programming mostly with Swift. And I was super excited because trying it from the first beta version of it, I suddenly become like, super uh, efficient building iOS apps with a lot of conciseness and um, expressiveness. 
And last summer, when our best engineers at Twitter were actually working on Fabric, um, we wanted to build this app and let's say building demo apps so people can understand the functionality we were about to ship. So we had this idea of like a magnetic poetry game uh, that would leverage a lot of functionality of Fabric. So I started sorry, buying the uh, um, app in the London office and shortly after my colleague Gareth, pictures on the screen, flew from headquarters to join me. So he would focus on the Android app, I would focus uh, on iOS. And on the Fabric team, we were super excited, but also a bit anxious about Swift, because back then, we were not sure if we would be ready on time to support it at launch in October uh, for our Twitter flight conference. So uh, we were far from done. And for you guys who actually tried Swift back then, you might remember that we were changing uh, Xcode version every other week. The language was still like changing quite a lot, so you had a lot of work to redo. But we still decided to take the bet on Swift. So we started writing this app on Swift, and we thought, actually, building an app that's full-featured in Swift would give us a clear insight and a clear goal whether or not we were doing great supporting Fabric, uh, Swift inside Fabric. So the app uh, was actually a success. We launched it on the App Store just the day before uh, flight, so it can be used on stage uh, throughout the day. So you can uh, see it on Tico slash CBIOS, and it's also whole open source on GitHub. So if you want to take a look and like, um, see how a full app is built in Swift, you're, you're more than welcome to do so. And actually, Swift is quite addictive <laughs> because we got this tour bus in the US for the ca past couple of weeks, and I was with Gareth um, traveling across the country with a few other colleagues, and we actually uh, built a few more demo Swift apps along the way. So uh, they're all going to be on GitHub as well. So now that I've given you this overview of Fabric and my personal story diving into Swift, um, I'd like to give you some uh, more details about how Fabric uh, supports Swift and how we made it so simple. So first, we focused on the onboarding experience. So for that, we decided to put together hundreds and maybe thousands of pages of docs that you can read, some great bedtime reading. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, as builders of SDKs, we don't want developers to spend any time configuring frameworks, configuring SDKs, reading wiki instructions, making sure they're up to date. That's a lot of your time. So what we did instead is we created some plugins. So that's on the screen, the Fabric uh, plugin for Mac, so you can develop on Xcode with it. And the first step is to pick and choose the functionality that you want to use. But let's say you're building an app in Swift. So for that, we decided to add some uh, detection of the language. But of course, a project can be both Swift and Objective-C. So what we do in that case is we look at your app delegate, and if we notice it's a Swift app delegate, then we'll provide you by default with the, the Swift uh, snippets to add to your app. You can just click, copy and paste, and you're good to go, you have some functionality uh, imported in the project. But with the amazingly large landscape of Objective-C libraries out there, there is one step that usually you have to do when you create an app in Swift these days, which is adding a bridging header. And I'm pretty sure most of you who use Swift and Objective-C combined as a, uh, have added some uh, bridging header in your apps. And that's one step that we actually wanted to remove uh, inside the, the developer uh, onboarding experience of Fabric. So what we've done instead is we've leveraged modules. Modules are the easiest and the most straightforward way um, to provide functionality that would be expo exposed both in Swift and Objective-C. So we uh, leverage module maps. So that's one example here for Fabric on the screen. And um, for developers, it's a breeze, because suddenly when you have these module maps exposed, there is no uh, need for a bridging header inside your Swift app. You're good to go immediately. So it worked quite out of the box, except for a few um, bits and pieces of the Fabric SDK. One of them was, for instance, the logging uh, facility that we have inside Crashlytics called CSLog. That one was a bit uh, tricky because we used macros and uh, C function with uh, variable numbers of arguments, and those two don't really play well with uh, module maps, so we just did a little bit of rework, and now it works uh, seamlessly across the board for Fabric. The next thing we focused on is how to initialize Fabric and load only the kits that you select, because we want to have Fabric kits to be um, very uh, tiny in, in size and have a super small footprint when you import Fabric kits inside your apps. You only want to have the features that you're actually using, not something bloated. And one of the design goals that we have for Fabric was to try to get a code that would look similar uh, across platforms, both iOS and Android. And when Swift was released, we were like, hmm, 
We're only a few weeks away from launch for Fabric, so it wasn't clear for us if, be, if we would be able to have something that would look familiar on both iOS and Android, but also between Swift and Objective-C. So we gave quite a lot of thought about that, and um, it turns out we actually succeeded to have something very similar for Swift, Objective-C, and Java. So we ended up with Fabric.with, which is um, a method that allows consistency and extensibility to load the kits and the functionality that you need inside your app. So you would do fabric that, fabric that with Crashlytics Crash when you only want to use Crashlytics and nothing else. You can use, of course, something else like Mopub instead, or maybe Twitter, or actually a combination of them. So you can load all the functionality if you need all of them for your apps. So that's how the code looks like in Swift. Um, in the did, did finish launching with option. So fabric that with Twitter and Swift, that's the Objective-C equivalent where you can see the, the add br square brackets to the kit. So that's about the onboarding experience for Fabric. But one of the biggest challenges that we've had uh, bringing support for uh, Swift inside Fabric was around Crashlytics. Because Crashlytics is not only about a few pieces of functionality that you would access inside your app. It's much more than that, because Crashlytics gives you a lot of insights around crash reports, and we aggregate them into issues. So it's a whole different story, and it goes far beyond exposing uh, objects. Who in the theater has used, actually, Crashlytics in the past in their uh, iOS apps? Wow, almost everyone in the room. That's awesome. So to give a, a quick idea of why Crashlytics is so useful when you build an app, um, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with these crash reports. That's what you get when an app is crashing. And this one is coming specifically from the Twitter um, internal app that we have to dock through the new features uh, on iOS. And obviously, they're super obscure. And to be frank, even as an advanced developer, you don't have much idea about what's going on and what you have to fix. On that screen, obviously, yeah, Twitter is mentioned on a few lines. So the problem might be coming from there, but still, you have no idea. So what Crashlix does instead is exposing all the information that you need as a developer to fix the problem. You will get the file name, the line number, the method, the params, the version of the app, because maybe you introduced the problem only on one specific version. But instead of getting thousands of crashes every single day, we aggregate them into issues, so you actually have uh, only a few um, bugs to focus on. So when we first heard about Swift, we were wondering, because like, could be a huge amount of work. And it could even have been like a whole new exception mechanism as part of Swift, and in that case, new ways to handle exceptions. But then we realized that actually Swift was mangled. So suddenly we had a lot of backend changes to perform because in order to get back the full stack trace, Crash 6 need to demangle the code. So what does that mean and how do we do it? First, we took the app DSIM. And the app DSIM is what contains all the information about symbols inside your app. We upload that to Crashlytics, and we pre-process the DSIM in order to transform it in a much more uh, efficient representation on our backend. And part of this pre-process is what we call the demangling. We used to actually do it for C++, so we just discovered we had to do it as well for Swift. So the problem is that there was not a great doc uh, to do uh, this demangling, and it was quite hard to re-implement. But fortunately, Apple released an utility called uh, Swift-Demangle, so we could use that, that command line utility, um, but it was quite slow. It turns out that Swift actually ships with code uh, to do this demangling. So we can use Swift to uh, actually demangle itself. So Crashlytics has an insanely complex and scalable uh, architecture to process super efficiently all the DSIMs. But the challenge was quite to hide a few layers between our uh, own stack and uh, to in, in Swift to interface between the two. But the cool thing I can tell you is we actually have a tiny bit of Swift on the crash processing system on our servers to do this demangling process. And the fun fact is we actually realized after the fact that we were actually 1,000 times faster by doing so than by using uh, the Swift demangle utility from Apple. But to be fair, the main reason why we're so efficient and so faster uh, is because suddenly by using Swift, uh, we were suddenly stopping to uh, start so many processes along the way. So um, it's much faster just to do everything in a go rather than starting a lot of processes for every single symbol. So um, 
So that's how we, we, uh, we implemented the, the demangling so fast. And to give you an idea, the sample lab cannon ball that I mentioned earlier is in about the thousands of uh, symbols. So when you get the demangling all set, that's what you get. That's an overview of the crash disk dashboard for Swift. So that's the Cannonball app and all the issues that we actually have to fix. They're fixed by now. Um, so you can tell all the, the information that you need. Uh, you have the, the line number, the, the function name. And of course, if you click any of those lines, you can actually dive into details. Uh, and you will get all the information about the devices, the memory, uh, all the version that you need to know to, to debug the problem. So success, that's what, how we got uh, Swift. Uh, up and running inside the Crashdix and, uh, and the full fabric uh, experience um, all set with, uh, with Swift. So I'd like to, uh, to uh, touch on one of the features in particular that we launched called Digits. And Digits is uh, a phone number based signed up. So the flow is very simple. We have such a great infrastructure at Twitter to build, um, to send SMS that we wanted to share this infrastructure with all of our uh, developer community. So what we've done is we built all the tools to provide a phone number based uh, view controller. The user will just select their country code and a phone number and uh, using an SMS verification code. As a developer uh, in Swift, you can get access to uh, all these uh, phone number information that's verified. So I'm gonna, just gonna do a, a quick demo of the onboarding of Fabric in the case of, um, in the case of Swift and Digits. I'm just going to jump over to Xcode and start a new project. So we're going to do a single view application project and I'm calling call my app .swift in Swift. So we're not sure what this app will do, maybe show the schedule, the speakers, the map uh, of the event. But at least what we know is we're probably going to need some identity system to log, uh, to log our users in. So I'm just going to create my app here. It's ready. And here I have the Fabric icon with the Fabric plugin. So I'm just going to hit New App, pause in the Finder, and select my .swift project. I'm going to add it to my projects. And I just need to pick and choose the functionality that I need. So Digits is part of the Twitter kit, so I'm just going to hit Install on the Twitter kit. I have a new build phase to add to my project, just to uh, register everything with Fabric, so it knows that this project works with it. And I'm just going to build. It's going to take a few seconds. All right, I'm built. So fabric, the Fabric plugin detected that I'm all set. So I just need to drag and drop my Twitter kit inside the .swift app project, finish. And now I have the functionality, to, uh, the, the option to pick a feature that I want to have in my app. So I'm just going to select digits. And here, as you can tell, there is Objective-C on Swift, but automatically the plugin noticed that I'm actually building a Swift app. So it just suggests me the Swift uh, snippets. So I'm just going to jump over to my app delegate because I have a few lines to add. The first is going to be the imports. Then I would have the fabric that with that I mentioned earlier to initialize fabric with just the toolkit. Next, I have some changes to do in my view controller. So I'm just going to import here. And I have this digits authentication button that I'm going to have in view did load. And I'm just going to run my project now. And I'm going to jump over to my phone here. All set. So if I tap that button, use my phone number, we take care of all the flow, picking uh, a country code, your phone number, and you're all set. Uh, if you do like a print LN in the completion block, you will get the verified phone number of the user. So that's all it takes, and that's how easy it is to get started with Fabric. I didn't even have to look at any docs, just downloaded the plugin, followed the few steps to add exactly the functionality that I want to add in my app, and I'm all set. So I'm just going to give you now some ideas, some thoughts around uh, what we've done with Swift and then what I've seen myself. Don't take all my words for granted because they're mostly experiments and things I've noticed myself. Around crashes, failures, and error recovery, the first thing I notice is that in Objective-C, two common uh, cases of crashes are dangling pointers or uh, object releases lifecycle. And Swift, even if it's pretty early on to tell and have some data, we believe that it's going to make both of them better uh, down the road. However, with like thousands of libraries uh, in Objective-C out there, we have a good understanding of the kind of failures they're going to have. Uh, but when used from Swift, it's still fairly new. So I'm pretty sure it's going to take us a few months to, to discover new type of errors or um, inconsistencies. And also, Swift automatically translates Objective-C APIs every time an object is referenced. Um, 
using the implicitly unwrapped uh, operator. So it gives the freedom of Objective-C, but the downside is in Swift, if you don't check for nil, and if there is a nil, you might crash. So that's one of the downsides of not having um, a way to, um, uh, to have an API that gives you more confidence. And there's also no way to catch exception in Swift, which is actually on purpose, but sometimes a few um, things like the NS keyed on Archiver, for instance, could be recoverable. So that's quite interesting and something that could be improved. Also, the Apple compatibility layers between Swift and Objective-C is pretty amazing. The fact that they run both on the same LLVM is quite uh, fantastic. The only drawback is when you have some Objective-C frameworks and let's say you have a method that return an NS array, in the Swift side, it's going to return you arrays of any objects. So in the case of the Twitter kit, for instance, it would be way nicer if you could return, if we could return arrays of tweets instead of any objects. So a compromise could be to duplicate uh, the interfaces to get the types and the optionals correct. Um, but uh, the one thing that's really interesting for you guys to understand um, is that Apple doesn't make any changes to their framework that would break the binary compatibility. So if you build an app today with UIKit, even if a UIKit gets updated, there's not uh, to worry about your app because UIKit is loaded from the system, it's part of iOS, and that's not gonna break anything in your app if they update it. But for Swift, even if they ship 1.0 and now 1.1, it's still far from done, and they know they're gonna change some classes, move or rename some of them. So what, we've, what we're doing instead these days is we're shipping the Swift runtime inside our iOS apps when they're building Swift. Um, so Swift developers have to ship the Swift runtime in their apps, but for SDK developers, we don't really know which version of Swift the developers are gonna use. So um, as much as we'd love to code our fabric kits in, directly in Swift, for the time being, it's not really possible because uh, we'd like also to avoid shipping the Swift runtime to, uh, to Objective-C only developers. So this is something that's probably gonna change when iOS 9 or later on uh, came around and then Swift uh, makes it part of, uh, of the system. And finally, you got uh, all the details from uh, Myers around uh, dynamic libraries. And our libraries have to be static for compatibility, uh, for compatibility before iOS 8. Um, but actually it's funny because for a long time, uh, if you had like a module map and if you use a static library, LLDB would get confused when you debug in Swift project and do the wrong thing. They just uh, fixed that issue recently. So for us, we'd love to do dynamic because we believe um, that we could do some very cool things in the future. For instance, using, let's say, the Twitter kit inside the playground. Uh, but just for the time being, it's slightly inconvenient for deployment. So we'll definitely keep an eye on dynamic libraries and see if we can improve the fabric developer experience with it. So to put some final words on this talk, uh, I, I would definitely say that all my team love Swift. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, we are all super excited about Swift. And for us, when we set out to create Fabric, uh, our goal was very simple. We wanted to share as much as we can, all that we've learned building Twitter app, building Crashlix, building the Fabric SDKs. And we've thought really long and hard about building SDKs, making them super easy to install, relieve the pain that developers have when they have to constantly maintain it and update them. So really for Swift, we wanted to go the extra mile and uh, the entire Fabric team is really committed to building a great uh, experience for iOS developers um, and building a best-in-class SDK for Swift uh, developers. So I really can't wait to see all the amazing apps you're gonna build with Swift. And uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing all of them. Thank you very much.